Hello, and welcome to the NCSS C3 Collaborative Literacy Professional Development Webinar, What Every Methods Teacher Should Know About the C3. This webinar, along with others in our series, are part of the College, Career, and Civic Life Framework for Social Studies State Standards Literacy Collaborative, C3LC, which NCSS is implementing in collaboration with the National Center for Literacy and Education, and which is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. My name is Anna Post, and I am the Director of External Relations and Council Communications at NCSS, as well as this grants coordinator. The goal of the C3LC initiative is to create and operationalize a plan designed specifically for social studies teachers to implement the Common Core State Standards for English Language Arts by utilizing the C3 framework. To learn more about the C3 Literacy Collaborative and take a look at the resources that have been developed, please visit www.socialstudies.org slash c3 slash c3lc. We are pleased to have Professors Kathy Swan from the University of Kentucky, John Lee from North Carolina State University, and S.G. Grant from Binghamton University doing this presentation today. These scholars worked as a leadership team for the C3 Framework Project, and over the past year, they co-created the Inquiry Design Model, IDM, as they collaboratively worked directing the New York Social Studies Toolkit Project. This important work is published by C3 Teachers, c3teachers.org. Without further ado, let me turn over the presentation to Kathy, John, and SG. On uh, what we're calling the Toolkit Project. Um, and that toolkit project is made up of 84 inquiries that use the inquiry design model that um, SG, John, and I co-created. It was a fun year um, to think about the ways in which uh, the C3 framework could impact classrooms. Uh, we spent a lot of time, um, as you all know, over the last few years in, in creating the C3 framework, thinking about how we might try and shift so social study standards throughout the country. Um, but at the very heart of, of our, our real jobs at our universities is, is training teachers and, and working with curriculum and instruction. And, and for us, it was like coming home this past year, um, thinking about the ways in which we might um, move um, to more ambitious ways uh, of thinking about inquiry. Um, so tonight is about that. Um, tonight is um, about um, uh, explaining some of the things that we've learned um, over the past uh, few years and, uh, and the ways in which we've um, put together what we're calling the inquiry design model. Um, so we'll start by saying that at the, at the very heart um, of the C3 framework, as you know, is the, is the inquiry arc. What you may not know is that in the early drafts of the C3, the inquiry arc was actually um, called the instructional arc. And it was probably because SG John and I so reflexively think um, about instruction. Um, while we think the inquiry arc was the right name uh, for the document, we also think there's an instructional work uh, or an instructional arc um, at work in classrooms as teachers support students to do inquiry in the social studies. So to that end, um, we spent some time uh, this past year, as I said, um, thinking about this new way of, of designing curriculum, building on um, the good um, design models um, that we've been using um, and, and trying to push them a little bit um, to more closely align um, to the C3. Uh, the IDM um, is, we think, is a, a pretty distinctive approach uh, to, appro uh, to um, uh, creating curriculum, um, one that uh, tries to um, have a lot of white space. Um, and, and what I mean by that is that we, we hope that by creating kind of minimalist curriculum um, that teachers can adapt it to their own context, to their own classrooms, to their own students. And that by providing the major ideas or the major post holes, what we often call in an inquiry, um, teachers will have the guidance um, that, that they might need and um, to, to breathe inquiry, um, breathe life into inquiry in their classroom. And so IDM rests on what we're calling a blueprint. It's a one page visual snapshot of an inquiry um, that pulls together the, the major questions, both compelling and supporting, uh, the tasks, uh, both formative and summative, 
and then the sources that students will encounter in, in the course of an inquiry. Uh, we had a chance to work with teachers in the great state of New York to develop 84 of these. Uh, they've come online. Uh, they're starting to come online. They're almost all online on our site, C3 Teachers. And tonight, um, what we hope to do is, is walk through one of those inquiries um, on Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, we're going to start by talking about questions. Uh, my colleague, S.G. Grant, will uh, bring us through component one of IDM. I'll take us through component two, um, tasks, and then John will uh, it will bring us through sources and then take us to the bridge by uh, bringing us on a journey um, of C3 teachers so you can uh, get a snapshot of other um, inquiries that are that are coming online. So with that, um, I will hand the microphone over to um, SG. Good evening all. I hope you've had a good start to the school year. Um, as Kathy said, we've had a, a, a great opportunity to, uh, to have done some work on the C3 and then be able to, to take those ideas and, and concepts and skills and then translate them into, along with nearly 60 New York State teachers, uh, translate those into curriculum. Um, we did not aim to, to create curriculum for the entire scope and sequence of, of uh, social studies in New York. That would take many, many years. Um, because as I imagine, and it's like most of your states where the curriculum is is very broad. But we were able to develop, um, um, as I said, curriculum uh, inquiries related to 84 different topics, uh, K through 12, six at each grade level. And um, they're designed, as Kathy said, around the, the notion of the, the inquiry arc in general and the, the inquiry design model in particular. So my job is to, to take you through the, the first part of it, which is, of course, in my view, the most important part, which is the idea of, of creating questions. And so if you have looked at your C3 inquiry arc recently, you know that um, having kids begin with a compelling question, teachers and kids beginning with a compelling question, is really the, the first kind of starting point for the, for the inquiry arc. Compelling questions, um, as we've framed it, have three components or three characteristics. They need to sort of set the, the framework for an inquiry, that kind of opening framework. They also have to express the intellectual rigor and the student relevance of an inquiry. And I'll talk a little bit more about each of those uh, in turn. And then a compelling question also sets up the summative performance task. Uh, that's one of the things that Kathy will spend some time on. Crafting uh, compelling questions really has these two key elements to them. They have to be intellectually rigorous. They have to speak to the, the main ideas, uh, the main concepts, the main generalizations and interpretations in the various disciplines. We're all pretty good at that, and so are most of our teachers. We know what the ideas are um, that revolve around social studies. What also needs to happen with a compelling question, and where we struggle sometimes as educators, is trying to find the relevance to kids' lives. Um, not in cute, um, clever kinds of ways, because students will see through that in a heartbeat, but in genuinely, intellectually honest kinds of ways. Um, and so these two key components are, are what I really want to spend most of my time on tonight. So thinking about the notion of intellectually rigorous, compelling questions, as I said, they have to re reflect an enduring issue, concern, or debate in the field. And they have to be amenable to the idea of using multiple lenses, disciplinary lenses and perspectives. As I said, they, they, there's all kinds of room for, um, for, for lots of intellectual parts of, of, of a compelling question. Um, there is no, as far as I can tell, no topic, no issue that's been resolved to everyone's satisfaction. And so, Things like the American Revolution, immigration, industrialization, name your, your topic, um, is still likely to be a vibrant one in some fashion or another. So the, the intellectual, intellectual part of creating a compelling question really is, is not that challenging for classroom teachers. It's where we turn the, the page and start looking at the, the piece of, about whether it's relevant to students that the real challenge comes in. To be relevant, 
A compelling question has to reflect one or more qualities or conditions that we know kids care about, and it has to honor and respect their intellectual efforts. Now, we know that on Friday afternoon, just before school break, it can be very tough to honor and respect uh, kids' intellectual efforts because there may not be a whole lot of that going on. But we also know that, that kids care deeply about many, many, many of the things that are going on around their lives um, in the social worlds in which they live. And so finding those kinds of connections to the things that kids care about um, and knowing that what they care about as first graders may be different than what they care about as 11th graders. Um, and trying to use the context in which teachers teach, that rural teachers in rural schools and teachers in urban schools are going to be able to draw on different kinds of experiences of the students that they face. Um, just as um, any of you who've ever taught uh, the same class, first period and third period, know that Sometimes you can do things with those first period students that you could never do with a third period class. So it's the idea of not only is it relevant to, is a compelling question relevant to students kind of in general, but it's particularly important that it's relevant to the particular students who are sitting in front of, of each teacher. So in the, the sample inquiry that we're going to be talking about tonight, it's the seventh grade um, uh, generally on the Civil War, but more specifically on the book Uncle Tom's Cabin. The, the compelling question, can words lead to war, we think works. First of all, the Civil War is one of those topics that we think has some legs in terms of its intellectual merit. But we also think that it fits the compelling question uh, characteristic of being relevant to kids because this notion of words leading to conflict um, is something that virtually every student sitting in our classrooms is going to have experienced at one time or another. The idea that language is, is one of the ways that we communicate our ideas and passions and all of that sort of thing, and that it's imprecise sometimes, uh, and can the, our best intentions in terms of language can still turn out to be problematic. Uh, and so this notion that words can be um, can lead to conflict and even to war um, is is the idea that we're playing off on the, in terms of the the relevance to students' lives. Supporting questions um, are are a piece that um, we have come through largely or come to largely as a result of working with teachers. It's often the case that a compelling question can be so wonderful that it just sort of um, unfolds. Um, but it is other times the case that we want to build up the support for uh, and the framework for a compelling question through the use of anywhere from two or three or four uh, kind of supporting questions to kind of build a, an intellectual um, scaffold for the compelling question. So supporting questions, um, both in the C3 and as we have found in the, the toolkit work, support and then extend the compelling question. They give a, a kind of architectural support to that question. They also represent the disciplinary knowledge that, that kids will need in order to not only address the compelling question, but then go on and um, answer the summative performance task. Supporting questions have to reflect the sources that are selected, so there has to be a, a, a key tie-in between those two elements. And then finally, they anchor uh, the formative performance task, because as Kathy will explain, we want to make sure that we have some opportunities for kids to try out their ideas and how they're thinking about them in a formative way before they get to the summative task. So the supporting questions for the inquiry on uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin are, how did Harriet Beecher Stowe describe slavery in Uncle Tom's Cabin? What led her to write the book? How did Northerners and Southerners react? And then fourth, what was the impact of Uncle Tom's Cabin on abolitionism? So you can see that there's, there's a kind of, um, not only are they scaffolding the compelling question, but there's a kind of intellectual complexity that's building um, from a, from a description in supporting question one to an assessment of impact in supporting question four. So one of the ways that we evaluate um, or, and look for um, the quality 
of an inquiry is to, is to sort of see that progression, that cognitive and intellectual progression across the, uh, the scope of supporting questions. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kathy. So I just wanted to comment that Rosella makes a really good point um, that I think at the very heart um, of the C3 framework and, and certainly of the inquiry design model is the idea that we're trying to honor, value, and respect um, what students know and, and to create some agency uh, within an inquiry um, uh, for students. And that while these inquiries are uh, teacher uh, kind of led, that the hope is that teachers are always keeping uh, students in mind and creating opportunities for students to um, express them, express their own thoughts within an inquiry. And, and, and let me just say this in case we forget, um, is that we see IDM as a, as a scaffolded model um, of inquiry, but that with all scaffolds, um, we think that scaffolding needs to come down over time and that, and that students would be more independent um, as they create and craft their own inquiries. So I just wanted to make a comment that, that I really appreciated um, that point. And Corey um, echoes much of, of what Rosella started um, in her comment, um, saying that, um, you know, that this is at the very heart um, of that nuance. So fantastic. I'm glad to see the chat box blowing up. Um, hopefully, we'll have a chance to do some question answers at the end. Um, so as, as, as she said, um, the first component um, of IDM um, sets the frame for the inquiry. It's the compelling question. Um, I like to say, for you big Lebowski fans, um, it's the rug uh, that, that ties the room together. Um, that's the question. It's the anchor. It's the frame for the inquiry. But how do we know uh, if students are understanding the inquiry? Um, how do we um, provide them opportunities for expressing um, answers um, to an inquiry? Uh, we do that through the tasks. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the tasks that are in um, the blueprint and then threaded throughout the inquiry. The tasks in IDM include the following four types. Um, summative performance tasks, formative performance tasks, summative extensions, and then taking informed action. So I'm going to start with the summative performance task, which is an argument, and then move, and then move through the other three. So as we said, um, IDM follows the C3 inquiry arc, um, but not necessarily linear, linearly. Um, it begins, um, as, Jeff, as she said, in dimension one. If students ask a compelling question, uh, they move to dimension four eventually, where they answer in the form of a summative argument. In the middle um, of that inquiry, what I call the guts of the inquiry, are the supporting questions, the formative tasks, and what we'll get to, uh, the sources. And I should say, just as a, as a little asterisk right here, that, um, that, that SG thinks uh, questions are the most important part of an inquiry. I, uh, John thinks that sources um, are the most important part of an inquiry, but I'm right in thinking that the tasks are the most important part of the inquiry. So we have this nice uh, academic tension uh, between the three of us. So uh, in any case, um, in the Uncle Tom's Cabin um, inquiry and in all the inquiries that we've done, uh, a major component is that the compelling question, uh, students answer in the form of an argument. And the argument looks similar um, across the K-12 grades with a little bit of variance for um, kind of abilities at the elementary versus the secondary level. So most arguments read the question, can words lead to war? Construct an argument that discusses the impact of Uncle Tom's Cabin using specific claims and relevant evidence from historical sources while acknowledging competing views. So I want to take that apart just a little bit the first thing I want to say is that every question, um, every compelling question, ends uh, with students constructing an argument. So that first part, constructing, we spent a lot of time talking about the word construct. Um, we wanted to make sure that we opened up argument to be not just writing a five-paragraph essay, um, but allow students to um, uh, present um, their argument in the form of an outline, a poster. Uh, in other ways that brings their understanding um, together. Um, that arguments um, are made up of claims 
um, backed by evidence, uh, and that students use sources um, to find evidence. Um, as students matriculate up, uh, particularly at secondary, they, they begin to acknowledge competing views um, and have counterclaims to those arguments. Um, so we see, um, we see this part of IDM being very convergent, um, so that the question converges around the argument. And we'll talk about the ways in which IDM is divergent, but it's really important, um, I was explaining this to my methods class on, on Monday, that, that essentially the compelling question and the argument are the, are the, the kind of lines that keep the inquiry plumb. Um, and, so, and so we think that's an important um, kind of structure um, to IDM. So how do we get students um, from their compelling question uh, to their summative argument? Um, well, we prepare them with content and skills uh, in the form of formative tasks. We give them lots of opportunities to learn about the content, to practice argumentation, um, so that they can write a coherent, evidence-based um, argument. So we see these formative tasks really encompassing dimension two and three um, of IDM, or of, of the C3. So as I said, um, in order to make a coherent evidence-based argument, um, students need practice with argumentation skills. They also need a strong content conceptual foundation. So I like to say that there's no gotcha assignment or assessment in, in IDM that we were very much exercise driven, not activity driven. So just like a marathon runner uh, trains to run the marathon, doesn't just wake up the next day and decides I'm gonna run 20 something miles, uh, they practice at it for months, sometimes years, in order to get to um, a successful marathon. In the same way, um, we, when we ask students to perform on a summative assessment in the form of an argument, we need to give them practice with that. Um, we need to get them up to speed on understanding uh, the roots of um, Uncle Tom's Cabin, understanding its impact, so the content of the inquiry, but also, um, also give them practice with writing claims, counterclaims, using evidence, using sources. Um, so these formative tasks, the guts of the inquiry, are framed uh, by the supporting questions that SG talked about. And one of the things that you'll note is if you look across uh, the inquiries, all 84 of them, uh, including the one that we're looking at tonight, that these formative tasks follow um, a skill progression of increasing complexity. So that the first formative task is, uh, uh, is not as complex um, as, the, uh, as the fourth um, formative task. So let's take a look. So you can see uh, the compelling question, can words lead to war, the four supporting questions uh, that that SG um, uh, talked about. Um, corresponding to each of those supporting questions is a formative performance task that does two things. One is it allows students to play and grapple uh, with the question, but two, it's a feedback loop for, for teachers um, in order to see, are my students getting it? Are they tracking with this content? And, and to be able to make on the fly uh, instructional decisions as they move through the inquiry. So as you look across these formative tasks, you can see that students have an opportunity to practice a number of things. Uh, one, summarizing. Uh, two, writing a paragraph. Three, comparing and contrasting and making a T-chart that ultimately ends in a claim. And then four, uh, participating in a structured uh, discussion regarding the impact of Uncle Tom's Cabin. So hopefully you can see this kind of increasing skill progression and you can see how these skills would allow students, would allow them to practice writing arguments. Additionally, you can also see a content progression, or what we call a content logic, that they begin by just the book itself, summarizing the plot of Uncle Tom's Cabin, beginning to think about Stowe's motivation for writing Uncle Tom's Cabin, beginning to think about the ways in which the North and South um, experienced this book and how they reacted to the book, and then um, what its impact was on abolition. Um, so we see these as important stepping stones uh, towards moving towards that summative argument as we talked about. 
Now, um, good social studies um, includes writing arguments. We, we hardwired that into the C3. Uh, we hardwired it into um, IDM. Uh, we believe that it represents an important shared responsibility in literacy and, and preparing students to be literate. But we also know um, that social studies is uh, more than that, um, that we need to give students opportunities to express um, their ideas in, in multimodal ways in, 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 a in a variety of different contexts. So uh, within IDM, uh, we created summative extensions and opportunities for students to take informed action. So let's talk about summative extensions first. So summative extensions come after uh, the argument, um, and there are ways that students can express their arguments. There, there are ways that they can adapt those arguments, um, just like we talked about in the C3 framework. Um, one of the indicators in Dimension 4 reads, students will present, present adaptations of arguments in venues outside the classroom using print and oral technologies and digital technologies. Um, so let me give you an example of those. So here uh, on this slide are three different inquiries um, that are snapshots of three different inquiries, uh, third grade and eighth grade and one of the 10th grade inquiries. So you can see the compelling question for the third grade inquiry is do people around the world care about children's rights? Each of these ends um, in a summative performance task of an argument. It begins with a question and then students construct an argument supported by evidence that addresses that question. But in each of these um, inquiries, students have an opportunity to take those arguments and extend them or adapt them. So in the case of the third grade inquiry, students can use that argument um, by, uh, and, and have a class, discuss, uh, excuse me, a class discussion using a take a stand protocol. In the eighth grade, uh, inquiry on Japanese-American internment, the question is, should freedom be sacrificed in the name of national security? While students would definitely craft or construct an argument, they would take that argument and it, it craft a statement that could be used in a court on the question of how to balance freedom and security. In the 10th grade French Revolution inquiry, was the French Revolution successful? Students might take that argument, that foundation, and then use these arguments um, within a perspective-taking exercise using the medium of Twitter. In a sense, the argument provides a firm content foundation for adapting these arguments in really creative um, ways that, that should live and breathe in the social studies classroom. But where the magic really happens, uh, we all know, uh, is in taking informed action, where, where students can um, take uh, their academic ideas, their intellectual ideas, and um, engage uh, in the civic square. Um, and so embedded into each um, inquiry is an opportunity for students to take informed action. And, and one of the things I want to say, so that I don't forget, is uh, I think probably I, the greatest accomplishment of the C3, I think, is getting the taking informed action in. Um, but then uh, I think it also scares teachers, the teachers that we've encountered, that, um, that they needed multiple ways to think about action that happened both in their classroom and outside of their classroom. And so we really saw the New York Toolkit Project as a, a way to paint 84 uh, different opportunities for students to take action. Some that were um, needed a, a lot of energy, teacher energy, and, and some that happened right in, in the confines of the classroom. Um, so that we, we painted pretty broad strokes about what, what um, engaging civically could look like for, for K-12 students. In keeping with the C3, though, um, we felt it was very important uh, for this action to follow a certain progression, that students begin by understanding a problem, uh, and then they assess the problem, and then and only then um, do they take some kind of action on the, on the problem. So I'm going to show you um, uh, the example uh, as it played out in the seventh grade Uncle Tom's Cabin inquiry. So you can see both the argument and the extension. Um, and then at the end of the inquiry, students have an opportunity to take this historic content and the ideas um, that are embedded within this inquiry and try and apply them to a current day event. 
So you can see, understand, identify and describe a human rights issue that needs to be addressed. Assess, create a list of possible actions that involve words. Again, pulling on the concept that really drives this inquiry. This may include letters, editorials, social media, videos, and protests. And then act. Choose one of the option, options and implement it as an individual, small group, or class project. Now, one of the things that we learned pretty early on, about this time last year, is that while action sometimes happens at the end of the inquiry, we wanted to make sure that we painted um, different uh, ways that, that, in, that action could happen in the course of an inquiry. So here's an example. Um, here's uh, the 12th grade, one of the 12th grade inquiries on the Affordable Care Act. The question is, why is the For Affordable Care Act so controversial? And you can see in this blueprint, it's looking a little bit different. Um, this is an excerpted blueprint. You can see that students in the supporting questions, one, two, and three, are trying to understand the problem. In supporting question four, they're assessing the problem. And instead of the extension um, at the end of the summative performance task, they act. They create a student guide to the ACA that explains why 12th graders should care about this act. Um, and so we tried to, and at least I would say 20 to 30 percent of the inquiries within the toolkit project really try to embed action uh, into, uh, into the inquiry. So with that, I'll stop um, and, and hand the mic over uh, to my good friend, John Lee. Thank you, Kathy and SG. Um, you set me up nicely to do what is the most important part of IDM, <laughs> which is <laughs> our work on sources. So Kathy and SG and I agree that sources are the most important because sources give us these <laughs> unique opportunities <laughs> to work with our students and um, in supporting them to engage content and to apply skills to learn that content. And so this kind of rounds out the IDM model. Kathy and SG have shown you these incomplete or sort of a, a, a building blocks of IDM, and now I'm going to layer in sources. Uh, three things that I want to talk about. I want to talk a little bit about the nature of sources, um, about the instructional uses of sources. So we've done some work as a team to think about how sources can be used instructionally. And then what we think is a very important consideration in planning for inquiry, which is what teachers need to do to sources to prepare the source for students to use the source. So first, this notion of the nature of sources. What we would suggest in the IDM is that sources have a very important relationship with task. Um, and for us, the source essentially comes to life through the task. Um, uh, an IDM task, which follows from a question, so a task can't exist without a question. But once the question occurs and the task has been put in place, then the task gets anchored by a source. And so what you see here is a complete sort of path through a, su a supporting question, one that SG talked about, uh, a formative task that Kathy talked about, and now some sources that anchor that task. And in this instance, as Kathy alluded to, the source here is going to be information about and from Uncle Tom's Cabin. So you see that we have three featured sources, and we use the term for the adjective featured strategically because we believe that uh, teachers need to take some responsibility for determining whether or not these are all the sources that their students would need, but these are some that we would recommend or suggest could be featured. And those sources work with the task in tandem to prepare students to be able to do the important work in the inquiry of building their knowledge. Sources play a very important role in the inquiry arc, and so Kathy and SG both talked about how questions and tasks are situated in the inquiry arc. What we decided when we looked at sources is, you know, the, the thing is, sources stretch across the entirety of the inquiry arc. And so as I talk about the instructional uses of sources, I think that will become clear, how sources connect to all four dimensions of the inquiry arc. Um, and sources, as I said, uh, um, support students as they gain knowledge and develop um, an understanding within the disciplines and as they apply skills to develop that knowledge. Now, we, of course, spend a lot of time worrying about the false dichotomy between knowledge and skills. One can't exist without the other. Um, and what we've tried to do is to put that into practice in IDM. And 
these tasks well, in the questions and the tasks and the sources um, with regards to the way that these things work together. But when students engage sources, it's not easy work. It's very difficult work. And, you know, that's because sources are difficult. And sources can come in all sorts of forms. It's really anything that we have created in our experiences today or in the past. Everything's on the table when it comes to sources. And, and the thing is, a lot of the sources, if not most of the sources that students engage in, in an inquiry were not made for the purpose for which the student is engaging them. And so they're having to use these expert uh, skills and approaches to using the sources um, at a time in their life when the child is not an expert. So that's where the teacher comes in. So we want to spend a little bit of time thinking about the instructional uses of sources. Um, and as a team, we came up with these. Kathy was really kind of the first mover on these ideas. And it was really a stroke, I think, <laughs> a stroke of genius to think about how sources can have different instructional uses. And we landed on these three. Um, we are uh, suggesting through our inquiry design model that sources can be used to spark curiosity. And now think back to the C3 framework and how that might connect to dimension one and compelling questions. Uh, we think that sources can be used to build knowledge, which of course will relate to dimension two and three. And we think that sources can be used and must be used to construct arguments. And of course, that would connect closely to dimension four in communicating conclusions and taking informed action. So let's talk a little bit about each one of those. First, with sparking curiosity. Um, you know, SG talked about how we want compelling questions to focus on relevancy and what children care about, what our students care about. Um, and in helping part of the, the role of a teacher sometimes is to help students recognize what they care about. Um, our students don't always come to class really knowing that. That's part of the uh, process of growing up and, and learning about the world. And so we believe that sources can play a role there. It might be a particularly engaging or dynamic source. It just gets kids' attention. It turns their head in a way that otherwise um, would not have, have um, Otherwise, students would not have been engaged. And so what, what we have done in the IDM model is to create a, what we call kind of a modular test that can stage an inquiry, that opens an inquiry by giving students an opportunity to learn about why a question is important to them and important to others in the field. And that would include experts in the field and the disciplines. And we often use sources to do that. And those types of sources are, in a sense, playing this instructional role. They are sparking curiosity. The second instructional purpose, well, here's an example before I go to the second one. This is an example from the Uncle Tom's Cabin inquiry. And it's an, a student video that was created um, in a project that is not part of the Uncle, Tom Cabin, Uncle Tom's Cabin inquiry. But it goes to this question of words and how words can be used to do things. Um, a lot of times kids learn, particularly in early grades, that words can hurt. And we have to be careful with words. This video is presented to show that words can lift up and words can make us better and can inspire us to do things. It's a video about the child labor activist, Kalish Satari, and uh, Nobel Peace Prize winning activist. And this video was made by seventh graders. And so, we present the video and offer the video up to kids as an example of how words can be used to do things powerful. The second instructional use of sources is to build knowledge. Um, and, you know, we, we think that in an inquiry, a source contains the disciplinary knowledge. It contains the concepts and concepts that students are going to need to complete the task. And the tasks connect together in such a way to enable and position students to be able to make arguments. So it's through students' engagement with sources that they're able to build the knowledge to be successful in making an argument. Uh, students apply disciplinary skills when they're building those knowledge or building that knowledge. And we know a lot about those skills and how to support students in doing that, given the research that's been done over the last couple of decades, particularly in the field of history. Um, and as students gather information from the sources during the inquiry, they're being strategic in pulling information that is going to be useful as evidence. And so we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, an example of how sources can be used to build knowledge, um, we could pick any uh, of the sources, but this is a particular source in the inquiry 
that came from the first edition of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Um, and this is published, the first edition of the book was published in uh, the winter of 1852. And uh, after the book had been, or after the material had been serialized in a magazine, um, the publication, first publication included six illustrations. And this is one of the illustrations. And the illustration here um, depicts uh, Chloe, who has just found out that she, or Eliza, I'm sorry, has just found out that her child George is going to be sold the next day, along with Uncle Tom. And she's come to tell Uncle Tom and Chloe, who is Uncle Tom's wife. And so students engage this illustration to learn about the emotion of that moment, the panic of that moment. Of course, if you know the book, Eliza makes the decision that night to run away um, and to take her child with her to uh, try to keep the, her family together. And so as students engage this, they're developing knowledge about what happened in, the, um, in this story. And of course, also what happened with the experiences of enslaved persons. So the third instructional use of sources, as I've alluded to, is to construct arguments with evidence. Once students have um, been sparked <laughs> and they're curious and they're interested in investigating, and once they've begun to develop knowledge, then hopefully they'll be in position to make an argument. And what we suggest in, the, in IDM is that students' arguments are composed of claims, and all claims must include evidence. So in the process of selecting evidence, students are going through the source material and the information they've gathered from the source material and repositioning that information as evidence. They need support to do that. It's difficult work. It's challenging work. And so um, I want to talk a little bit about how teachers can prepare um, students and prepare the sources to help students be successful in that process. First, I want to show you um, what some of the sources are. Uh, that we're using in this inquiry if you haven't seen the inquiry yet. Now, this particular slide uh, does not include the compelling questions, but you see the formative tasks that Kathy talked about. Those four tasks build in complexity. Um, they're providing students an opportunity to develop the knowledge, to accrue the understanding, to have the information available so that they can make this summative argument that is composed of claims and evidence. In the first formative task where students are working on the plot of Uncle Tom's Cabin and identifying the main ideas and supporting details, we'd have students engaging someone else's summary of the book and excerpts from the book, as well as those illustrations. The second task, which is about Stowe's motivation, we have two sources. One of them is actually from the book. There were some concluding remarks in the first edition of the book where Stowe writes in third person about her motivation about why she wrote it. We also have a letter uh, that she wrote to Lord Thomas Denman, who was a former, uh, basically, solicitor general in Great Britain um, and was a supporter of the abolitionist movement in the United States. And so Stowe, interestingly, in this book, what students will learn, or in this letter, what students will learn is that Stowe, in part, was motivated by her political activity in the abolitionist movement. So in some ways, when you read that, you might want to make a claim that Uncle Tom's Cabin is a political tract. In the third task, students are comparing contrasting reactions to the book. And so, of course, we're going to have sources that represent um, the viewpoints in the two regions, um, north and south. And then in the fourth task, students are participating in a structured discussion. And we have a number of sources here that range across different types of uh, political and public um, uh, essentially responses and, um, to Uncle Tom's Cabin. And so we think that when students, and we've seen this in a pilot of this inquiry, that when students are finished with this fourth task, when they've participated in the structured discussion, they're prepared to compose the argument, to construct an argument that is made up of claims and evidence. OK, so the inquiry is all set up. You've seen all the pieces of the inquiry. In order for this inquiry to work, the sources have to be very carefully prepared. And so what I want to talk a little bit about is how our team prepared these sources and some of the generalizations that we've been able to develop from our work with all these sources. And we've found that we do three things consistently. One is spend a lot of time selecting sources. Two, these are out of order. The second thing I'm going to talk about is adapting sources. And the third thing is scaffolding sources. So first, selecting sources. Um, 
of course, all of you know that we live in this amazing moment right now where we have access to information or to uh, disciplinary materials in ways that were unimaginable when SG was young. Um, <laughs> Kathy and I weren't born then. <laughs> We had mimeograph machines. That's right. <laughs> um, and so we found ourselves online a lot and, and in libraries. We actually physically were in libraries. Like that Lord Thomas Denman letter was not available online, but we tracked it down and got a digital version of it. Um, and so through online work, through collaboration, through sharing, we can find the sources that we need. Um, and, you know, these are some of those sources. So, uh, you know, we... We spent a lot of time um, in Uncle Tom's cabin making decisions about what to use here and selecting that source. So this is an example of sources that we've selected. A second thing that we do that is equally important, maybe more important than the sources being selected, is adapting the source. As I said earlier, none of these sources were really created for the purposes for which we're putting them to use. Uncle uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe didn't write the book, so kids in 2015 can learn about um, you know, the lead up to the Civil War. She didn't know the Civil War was coming. And so we have to do things to these sources to prepare them. One is to excerpt. Of course, we don't give Uncle Tom's Cabin to kids. We take excerpts out, very carefully selected passages. Another thing that we do, and this can be controversial, is modify passages. That may mean changing words, um, updating spelling, uh, uh, changing some of the vernacular in it so it's accessible by students. A third thing that we've done is to annotate text um, or annotate any source, just to provide additional information. We want to be careful there because we don't want annotations to become replacements to the text or to the source so that students don't have to engage the source and instead they're just reading the annotation. But we think that that can be useful. Examples, of course, the text passages that we pulled out of Uncle Tom's Cabin were carefully excerpted. We have a summary of Uncle Tom's Cabin that was modified, so it was pulled from a secondary source, but we felt like the way it was written was challenging, and so we made some changes to it. And then we provide uh, an annotation to go with the illustration that I showed you earlier. Um, we also want to acknowledge that the word adapt or adaptations is used, um, of course, in special education, and we understand that, and we know that when we use the word adaptation that we may have people that ask us if we mean adaptations in terms of making the kind of changes to instruction or instructional materials that children would need um, with regard to differentiation or special needs. That is not what we're doing here, um, but we do understand that that's very important and that work has to be done in order for these inquiries to be successfully used in the wide range of classrooms that we'd hope they'd be used to. And I've already mentioned there can be objections to changing sources. Some people take very hard lines with regard to um, whether or not a source should be modified. Uh, the third thing that we found ourselves doing very consistently is scaffolding. Um, and of course, we all know a lot about scaffolding as teacher educators. That's a, a very important concept and tool that we teach our, t our student teachers or our teachers to be. Um, and so, you know, what we're trying to do is to recognize that scaffolds provide novices in the classroom. Um, children in the classroom with support for doing the complex work they're doing. We have novices and we're trying to get them to do expert-like work and scaffolds provide these systems um, that support novices to do expert-like work. Uh, we develop scaffolds in the toolkit that are sort of idiosyncratic. They relate directly to formative and summative tasks that are in these inquiries. We um, we chose not to use off-the-shelf scaffolds. There's a lot of them out there like Skimsy or Parts or Soaps, and, and you all might have some. And we think those are all valuable. We just made a decision in this project to use kind of homegrown scaffolds or scaffolds that relate very closely to what the task calls for. Um, so I'll show you a couple of examples of, of those. Actually, this is, this is a full source. So I, uh, we put this in here so you could see an example of an excerpted source. Um, this excerpt from Uncle Tom's Cabin is taken to give children a sense of um, kind of what the emotional relationship uh, or experience that Eliza was going through. She made that decision to leave with her child. This is an example of, of one of the scaffolds. It's an organizer. Um, in a sense, you can see that there are five things that students would be expected to do. 
They be expected to do a summary, to provide details, to talk about the tone of the text. So that, that scaffold goes with this source, the tone or, um, that's in the language, um, the intention of the author, and the reactions of the reader, so the reactions of the student. So we've come to um, almost the end. This is the complete blueprint. Um, and you can see questions, tasks, and sources arrayed in the complete blueprint at the top is our compelling question and our supporting questions underneath. Uh, the task follow from the supporting questions and then the sources are in place to support students' work on the task. Of course, the summative task occurs after students have completed the summative, excuse me, the formative task. And so it comes at the bottom and then as Kathy talked about the taking informed action, which may or may not come at the conclusion of an inquiry. It may be, as Kathy said, embedded in an inquiry and occur along the way. Uh, this is a, a screenshot of the, of the uh, Uncle Tom's inquiry online. And so what we want to do right now is to take you online and I want to show you the website where the inquiries are. And uh, that'll just take a couple minutes and it'll leave us some time for questions. So this is the time where I share my screen. Before all of you that. write us though about the missing apostrophe in uh, Tom, um, we have corrected that. This is the home page for C3 teachers. And as you can see um, at the top, there's a link to inquiry. So if I click on the inquiry link, we're going to get um, three featured inquiries that we've selected. One of them is Uncle Tom's Cabin with an apostrophe. And there's also something we call a filter. It's a, just a way to sort of sort through the 84 inquiries. You can select inquiries by grade. Um, all of these inquiries are from our New York hub, but we hope to be doing work with other states and groups and publish additional inquiries. And you can also browse by topic. But I'll go down to Uncle Tom's Cabin and click on it. And uh, when I click on it, you're basically going to get the blueprint on this page. You can download a PDF of the blueprint and a doc version, a Word version. We provide the Word version because we have an open source approach to this work and we want people to get the inquiry and to remix it and to make it work in their community. And so all of these are available for people to do with what they um, think is professionally appropriate. Across the top, you also will see information about the inquiry design model where um, we provide the blueprint that we've talked about in template form. And so that's a Word document that you can download. Um, and then we have something called an at a glance that has sort of little annotations for each one of the sections of the IDM model. Um, and also uh, we have some blogs that are going. We have a series of publications that we'd invite you all to take a look at. Um, and if you want to get a monthly update, please click join if you haven't done that and we'll be happy to send that out to you. But I think that brings us to the point where we can do some questions now. You know, the title of this webinar is what every methods teacher needs to know. And I think that um, SG John and I, I'm certainly um, teaching in my methods class, both my in-service teachers, my doctoral students, and my uh, in-service teachers, as well as my pre-service teachers, using IDM as a way of thinking uh, about uh, framing inquiry and, and implementing um, curricular inquiries in the classroom. Um, so, SG, do you want to like you want to take Corey's question? Sure. Um, Corey's asked, "What guided the creation of the 84 questions or inquiries in the toolkit?" Um, the what we really did was we looked at the the New York State framework, which has both global kinds of goals, and then content specific kinds of of uh, key ideas and and that sort of thing. And what we tried to do, frankly, was to look at some of the topics. Um, I worked particularly with the K-4 teachers. We looked at topics that aren't typically covered or aren't covered very well and tried to write inquiries about those. Again, you can imagine that you've got six inquiries per grade level. There are far more topics than can be that could be covered. Um, and so we, we um, tried to, to, to do a, a representative group of topics, but certainly did not try to be comprehensive on the idea that what we really wanted to do was to share this approach to curriculum writing, the inquiry design model, and then have teachers sort of take it from there. 
So as you're exactly. saying, we should, Corey, we um, you know, it helps Illinois adopt new standards based on the C3. Like one, um, one thing that we're hoping to do um, is really build out other hubs. Um, you can see there's a little placeholder up on C3 teachers right now, but we would like to see um, New York thrive, but also um, great states like Kentucky and North Carolina and Illinois, and that, and that maybe they think uh, those states or districts or teachers think about the ways in which inquiry, um, these inquiries could flourish in their particular context and, and match up to, um, uh, to their state standards. I was going to add um, something that kind of goes back to uh, where we started, and Anna was talking about the overall project and the effort by NCSS um, through this great found, uh, funded work. Uh, we are also working with a group of teachers in 16 states um, to develop instructional materials that incorporate what we know about the C3 framework using the inquiry design model and paying special attention to Common Core. Um, that work is underway and um, it's, it'll produce, uh, it'll result in uh, the production of materials, including inquiries that we'll be sharing at the end of the year. And so we just wanted to make sure that y'all knew about that con uh, connection and, and uh, We'll send the materials out, of course, through NCSS and through C3 Teachers. So if you uh, sign up for the newsletter, you'll get a, an update about that work. We also have a clinic, a pre-conference clinic, that's going to be on Thursday where we'll, we are going to be able to continue this conversation. Um, it's called the C3 Foundry. Um, so we're kind of using this building concept and metaphor to just to continue the process of creating inquiries and, and working on our process. Maybe I'll take the question on um, pre-service and in-service teachers and their reaction. Um, John and SG and I have had an opportunity to present to mostly in-service teachers in Missouri, in Kentucky, in Arkansas, North Carolina, Hawaii, really in a, in, in a lot of places. And the reaction from in-service teachers is just abundantly positive. I don't think we've uh, met a teacher yet who goes, oh, I just don't think that captures, um, you know, what the big ideas of, of what I'm trying to do in the classroom. So we've, we've felt really great about that so far. Um, Pre-service teachers, and I see SG's writing uh, a little bit about this um, on the chat box. Um, Pre-service teachers, I'm working with my group right now um, here at UK, and, and they have challenges no matter what kind of curriculum that you put in front of them. Um, so, you know, this is pr a pretty sophisticated idea. A, you know, kind of the first threshold is, is teaching them that inquiry is good and, and all the reasons that we should think about having students uh, engage in inquiry. Um, but then the actual crafting of com compelling questions, the kind of thinking about tasks, the summative and formative relationship, and then on top of it, layering on the least important part of IDM, just kidding, John, sources, you know, um, and thinking about not only how do you select sources, but then how do you use sources uh, with students and have them read sources in a way um, that, um, that supports the inquiry. So I'm still plugging on um, with my pre-service teachers, but I wouldn't, I, you know, last year and the year before I used Understanding by Design. Um, this year I'm using IDM. Um, and the work that John and SG and I have done, and I'm noticing the similar challenges, which is being a new teacher is just challenging. <laughs> and so teaching them how to write curriculum is challenging. Go ahead, SJ, sorry. No, I think that's exactly right. The, the thing that I would add that I think is the, ad, the advantage of IDM is that it, you, you can't just write a lot of stuff and hope that it's going to make sense eventually. Um, I don't know about you all, but, but I have students who, who figure if they put more words on the page that they'll somehow convince me that they know what they're talking about. When you have to put all of your ideas um, on one page, uh, it really forces you not only to be clear about what each um, formative task is, what source 
um, what supporting question, but it also forces you to start looking at the interrelationship among all of those ideas. And, um, you know, when we were working with the teachers originally as writers, um, they got stuck a, a lot. Um, but they also kept coming back to it. And, and as Kathy said, we have yet to see or hear a teacher say, well, you know, this is all pie in the sky stuff, um, but, but who needs sources? Or why in the world would you have a question um, in front of kids? We're, we're finding teachers nodding their, their heads, uh, both pre-service and in-service, um, when, they, when they look at how the model sort of unfolds. So I see Jenny Sinclair's question. Um, I'm an elementary teacher and curriculum lead in Iowa. Iowa has not adopted the C3. What, where is the beginning place? I think the exciting part of this project, this New York project, and, and more specifically IDM, is that you know we've been working with states um, for about five years now, um, trying to shift policy. Um, around social studies, and that has is thicketed with challenges. Uh, I think it's good work. It's going to earn us a spot in a heaven somewhere um, eventually, I think. Um, and it will absolve us of all of our sins of the past, maybe. I don't know. Maybe SG. Um, the rest, John and I, might need to do a little bit more work. But the good news is that we feel that C3, through kind of this conversation about inquiry within the four walls of the classroom can really make the inquiry arc come alive. That it isn't dependent on a state adopting or not adopting standards because good instruction is just simply good instruction. And so I think where we feel, you know, um, great success this year is, is trying to break through to a model that is accessible and um, resonates with teachers and where they feel instructionally supported, even if maybe their standards don't perfectly align, and that they could use perhaps their content standards as a starting place to really think about um, kind of reframing their, their curriculum, um, it, it, you know, kind of to be more C3-like. So in a sense, you know, just creating more agency for teachers um, in, in, in kind of the shifts that the C3 is talking about. John or SG, do you want to take? Um, I, can't, I can't see the chat you. box. <laughs> so can you Here, read I'll, it? I'll, 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 I'll read, read you the question, the John. Time. Okay, pay attention, John. Ready? Would okay. you say, I, would you say tasks are most important? Now, would you say IDM is an instructional approach to tie the four dimensions of the C3 together? Yes. Yep. <laughs> so I, we start, it's interesting though, because we, we started thinking that we were going to be able to develop instructional ideas across the four dimensions. And so we worked on a, on a book um, right at the publication of the C3 with curriculum partners who were instrumental in bringing the C3 across the, the finish line, and NCSS was um, uh, generous and supportive enough to publish this as a bulletin, the Teaching the C3 Framework Bulletin of, of last year. And the instructional ideas in those are articulated pretty tightly and carefully across the four dimensions. And as we continue to play with kind of our thinking about the ways in which the instruction played out across those four dimensions, we kept bumping into a very consistent problem, which is it doesn't work that way. Students engage content in dimension two, and they use those skills and um, concepts or tools and concepts in dimension two all across the inquiry. And so uh, we just iterated our way to IDM. And IDM is an instructional representation of the standards and curriculum work that was in the C3 framework, or at least that's the way we see it. It's an instructional design uh, representation of the C3 framework. Let me put it that way. One of the points that Kathy made early on was that there's really a kind of blurring of the curriculum instructional kind of um, notions that we sometimes want to hold so, so separate. Um, it, it is, um, as John says, an instructional 
kind of approach. It's a curricular kind of approach. It's, it's a way of putting teachers, kids, and ideas um, all in the same place and, and doing work that, that has some, some real um, meaning, not just for following the state curriculum, but for, for kids and the lives that they live. And, and so far, that's what we have seen um, in the teachers who've been piloting. Um, I'll, I'll tell a quick story. We had a, a second grade teacher piloting an inquiry on rules, and they'd been working on it for an hour or so when one of the kids came up to her and said, you know, Miss Valentine, this has been the best recess we've ever had. Now, the teacher is a veteran teacher, and she doesn't tend to get thrown very easily, but second graders can throw anyone. And so she looked at the kid and said, well, we actually haven't had recess yet today. And as a typical second grader, he said, well, what have we been doing? And when she said social studies, there was a cheer that went up around the room. So we think that we've really hit a kind of sweet spot when, when we can put social studies and recess in the same sentence in a positive kind of way. Well, hooray for social studies seems like a great way to end this webinar. Um, way to take us to the bridge, SG. Um, I'll just end with a quick note that we have more things that are coming online uh, with C3 Teachers. We partnered with Tribeca Films and did a series of four videos that helped to really illustrate different components of IDM and the New York project. Uh, we've got professional development materials um, that um, articulate some of the things that we talked about tonight in greater detail. And, and we're excited, too, that we've been asked to do a series of three articles in the upcoming social education uh, issue, the November issue, um, not the swimsuit issue, but the November issue. Uh, so we're excited um, about that as well. So stay tuned. Um, and I think we would love to hear stories. Um, we love to hear these stories. Just like SG told the Hooray for Social Studies story, we would love to hear your stories um, from the field. So please email us, join C3 Teachers. Uh, stop us in the halls um, at the NCSS Annual Conference. Come join us at the C3 Clinic. Uh, and thank you uh, for joining us tonight.